Welcome to Pharmaceutical Technologies Podcast, How to Master Change Through Life and Inhalation Drug Delivery, brought to you by 3M Drug Delivery Systems. This podcast discusses the long cycle inhalation drug delivery business. Richard Beasley discusses the innovations that have changed the industry and provides insight into the continuing challenges that face the pharmaceutical companies working in this industry. To find out more about 3M Drug Delivery Systems, please visit 3m.com slash DDS. And now, here's your host, Reed Paul. Welcome to our program, Richard. I'm wondering if you can start by giving us a brief overview of inhalation drug delivery over the years for our listeners. Thank you, Reed. It really is a pleasure to be featured on your podcast. Thank you for asking me. Inhalation delivery goes back way back. Its first recorded use in history was around 4,000 years ago. Um, There's evidence in the historical record that humans used to smoke a trope of belladonna to help suppress coughs. Luckily, we've come a long way since then. About 60 years ago, the pressurized meter dose inhaler was invented, and that's really where uh, we in 3M specialize. This industry-changing invention actually came from the needs of a 13-year-old girl, Susie Mason, who frequently suffered from asthma attacks and used to squeeze uh, bulb nebulizer that she had. That was a popular treatment at the time. But she was frustrated by how inconvenient it was, and trust me, it really is. So she asked her father, why can't my asthma medicine work like mum's hairspray? Well, luckily for her, and every other asthmatic, her father, George Mason, president of Riker Laboratories, he set his research scientists to work at finding a solution like the one Susie proposed. The rest of the day is history. If we flash forward to the present, um, currently the market is divided into pressurized meter dose inhalers. These are commonly known as uh, MDIs, and indeed dry powder inhalers too, uh, and they're known as DPIs. For drug delivery, usually the respiratory system, the market is valued around $37 billion each year with 920 million devices. MDIs are around 60% by volume, or about 40% of the sales value. So it's a huge, huge market, and you can understand the interest that uh, focuses in on it. MDIs are primarily used to treat COPD and asthma, although they can be used to treat a wide range of other therapeutic areas using the lung as a a delivery system. This includes expansion to nasal drug delivery for allergies. We saw a resurgence of MDIs in this market earlier this year. It's amazing how a big change can be driven by one individual, and it sounds like that change can occur pretty quickly. Speaking of changes over time, what is the typical life cycle of an inhalation drug and its delivery mechanism? Well, as far as life cycles go, there really isn't a typical situation. Um, New developments can reduce the life of a product, as can generic competition. In addition, other factors may result in significantly different life cycles, although they all take a while to get to market. Let me show you what I mean by that. First, let's start by talking about how drugs are developed. I should point out here that 3M gets involved in formulating the drug for delivery after the initial stage. That's where our expertise really starts. Uh, the first step begins with the research phase for chemical targets to address particular therapeutic areas. This step alone could take anywhere from one to three years or even longer. Following this is the development stage. The drug can, will be taken through a series of phases to test its safety, efficacy, and a range of other attributes in order to prepare it for regulatory submission and approval, and obviously the tolerability of that as well for use in humans. And this could take an additional seven to ten years. After all that, the product hits the market, which for a new entity you can expect between six to ten years of patent protection before generic competition occurs. The product could then be in the market for any period of time after that. To give you a real-life example of how this works, let's consider GlaxoSmithKline's blockbuster serotide. This drug was first approved in 1998 and marketed from 1999. Its U.S. patent expired in 2010, and its EU patent expires this year. There are currently no generic MDI products for serotide, so this product has already managed 14 years in the market, and that is after all the research and development time. It is expected that a generic will eventually be launched to challenge serotide, but even so, it would likely only affect volumes and pricing. Sales of serotide could still continue for many more years beyond expiration of the patents. So we are talking about a very long business cycle, which could be 30 to 40 years from initial research to withdrawal from the market. 30 to 40 years is quite a long time. What sort of changes could we expect to see over that period? <laughs> That's a great question. Just think how different the world was you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. We are talking about the mid-1980s. Compact discs were just being introduced, 
and now those are largely obsolete. The Cold War was an ongoing concern, but there hasn't been a Soviet Union for decades now. Equally, the farmer and drug delivery markets were considerably different from today, and the speed of change over that time has been furious. We're talking about fundamental changes on a very basic level, how best to compete, how best to be first to market, how to adapt to changes in raw materials and formulations, how to meet regulations, and so on and so on. Let's review some of the changes, if we could, that have happened over the last 30 years on a global scale. Environmental concerns have grown across industries. This resulted in the Montreal Protocol, which worked to phase out CFC use. And it changed the game entirely. As a result, new delivery methods and propellants came to the market. Patient compliance has grown in focus. The autohalo is a great example of that, the first ever breath-assisted device, which was launched by 3M. We also saw the advent of tighter dose and extractable requirements. Patient compliance has grown in focus. The FDA began to consider regulations around human factors. They strongly recommended dose counters on MDI products in the U.S., which has also become a recommendation for Europe too. BlackTopSmithKline introduced the first DC dose counter, followed by 3M introducing the first DC available to third parties that, are, that the FDA have approved. In addition, we've seen financial pressures lead to consolidation across the industry, with increasing number of mergers and acquisitions. This has resulted in moves to and from outsourcing and back again. We have also seen blockbusters losing patent protection, leading to the growth of generic competition. Some of these pressures have forced the industry to be faster and leaner. In the past four years, there have been four single-cycle FDA reviews for MDI products, all of which 3M has been fortunate enough to be involved in with clients, and that increases the speed to market so we can start making money back from the uh, investment development. So a lot has happened in the last 30 years that we would not have predicted. Similarly, we can't predict what is going to happen in the next 30 years. All we can do is manage our business to be proactively ready for change, ideally drive change, and to build relationships with partners that can respond in an equally agile manner. You mentioned a range of changes in the industry. Would you mind explaining the impact of these a little more, specifically how new regulations are affecting the industry? Sure. In terms of changes driven by regulation, we're seeing that the tighter regulatory requirements of the U.S. are becoming more commonplace across the world now. Emerging markets are looking to the U.S. and EU regulations as their benchmark, increasing the standards and ultimately increasing the cost to enter these markets. Great news for the patient to know these controls are in place, but it will ultimately impact the price they pay for their medication. Good manufacturing practice has become legislated for pharmaceutical companies in many countries now. Of course, this enhances the quality of the product as well as the global working conditions within pharma and drug delivery and manufacturing. For many of us in the industry, we already work to our own high internal standards, which include Lean Six Sigma manufacturing and process controls, always focused on the quality of the products. Legislation ensures everybody considers these factors, and this results in a lot of additional work for the industry. As more blockbuster patents have come close to expiry, or have indeed expired, regulators have had to tackle the questions around how to manage and control new generic copies of these products. The current focus is around bioequivalency, of the generic copy compared to the innovative products. This is more focused on technology that can understand existing products and can then replicate them while navigating the extremely complex patent landscape. Testing is focused around comparing the new product with the innovator and ensuring that it fits within the existing approved product specification. These changes keep life interesting. These things are simple to say, but in practice they are very challenging. And as we try to stay one step ahead of the competitors and the next wave of legislation, our background and history allows us to do this. They say the only constant is change, and you've just proved it. What about material substitution? How has that impacted the industry? Yes, it presents us with some distinct challenges. It's important not to underestimate the impact even a seemingly simple material substitution can have. Consider the materials used in our industry compared to other industries. Farmer may use them in low volume. Polymers used in sealing rings may be used in high volumes in other industries, such that if they require a design change or even a switch to an alternative product, then the impact on the small volume we use can be really significant. Either the cost jumps up or we have to requalify the new variation of material to ensure it still complies with the regulations. It could be that we are just impacted by both cost and requalification. So what helps one industry can actually have a detrimental effect on our business. Now consider the broad range of components that we use across 920 million devices produced each year. And add in heavy regulatory requirements, you have a recipe for continual change to maintain support 
through the life of a product, coating changes, polymer changes, amendments to manufacturing processes, new active ingredient sources. The list really does go on and on. Change of propellant from CFC to HFA was initially thought of as a simple material substitution, but this developed into a change that affected almost every aspect of drug delivery and required cross-industry teamwork to solve the problem. In the end, 3 gathered expertise from across its divisions to develop the very first HFA formulation for an MDI, which is still a very successful product today. I see that small substitutions can have big consequences. What about outsourcing or insourcing? Can you tell us a little bit about the ins and outs of those approaches? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. I mean, pharma may look to outsource or insource at various stages in the value chain, depending on its core strengths and what level of investment they would like to make in a particular program. It may be that they look to buy late-stage drug developments that they can then commercialize directly or, with, or indeed with a partner. The main benefit of this is that they get to scale back their own upfront investment, changing the investment profile is something we have seen across the industry. And different profiles work for different companies. We've seen a growth in outsourcing commercial manufacturer products. Initially, it was to emerging markets in order to improve costs. More recently, though, it's been to specialist contract manufacturing organizations both in the EU and the US, where total life cycle value is considered rather than just initial cost. There are pros and cons to any investment, as you can imagine, and indeed to any partnering model. But any decision has to be aligned with a larger strategic intent. Keeping contract manufacturing in-house may require a lot of capital investment and indeed infrastructure, which would take a long time to pay back, although the benefit is having control of your own manufacturing quality and, and obviously the supply chain. Partnerships reduce the need for as much of front investment, but each party has to be willing to share both risk and revenue for a long period of time. Because of this, you want to pick the right partner, one that's going to be around tomorrow and the day after. Complete outsourcing presents its own challenges and indeed opportunities. A company could go through a period of breaking up the value chain across a number of suppliers to get the best deal, as it were, in quotation marks. But find that there are additional hidden costs, such as transferring from one company to the next, the industry has seen a trend away from this fragmented model toward an end-to-end -end approach which helps manage the transition between project stages. Overall, though, whatever the structure, it is really important to ensure that your capability, either directly or through a partner, that will be around for the entire product life cycle. If new partners are required to pass the way through a program, then it is likely to add cost and indeed risk to the program, and in some cases may even make the program no longer viable. So far, we've only briefly touched on this, but it's at least as important as everything else we've been talking about. How do you account for the expectations of patients when you design inhalation drug delivery systems? That's a really great question, and you're right. It's the one we must be careful not to overlook. Patients are increasingly expecting easy ways to administer medication to fit in with their busy schedules. We really have seen a growing number of smartphone apps and other ways of intelligently monitoring and providing more feedback to patients. And this trend is really growing. Because patients expect and want to be more informed about their treatments, patients have told us that they truly value having an accurate dose count on their device, as an example. This ranks as one of their favorite features. Within the whole pharma industry, there is a real drive towards taking human factors into account to promote patient compliance. Non-compliance of taking medicine costs the entire industry, around $290 billion annually in additional costs and $188 billion in lost profits as a result of complications to treatment. So you can see the size of the problem. Understanding human factors means not only taking into account the therapeutic needs of patients, but also the needs they develop from using other products in their day-to-day -day lives. To name one example, look at the mobile telecommunications industry. They are in a continual competition to enhance their device interfaces. That's all driven by this increased awareness of human factors, or more simply put, how the customer interacts with the product. What we do is no different. We survey patients on every aspect of their innovation device. We do this thoroughly at the prototype level, so we can be confident that the device we're bringing to market is one that people will find easy to like. And yes, patient feedback directs any change we make to the device. Indeed, it's a real strength for us. Generic competition is something that affects everyone in the industry, and you've mentioned it in passing. What are some of the trends you're seeing in regard to inhalation technologies? It takes real differentiation to protect your product from generic competition. I mean, this effort requires time, commitment, constant vigilance, and a whole lot of R&D. 
Speaking from my own experience pre the drug delivery system, the introduction of dose counters and indicators have been a big, big help in differentiating our partners' products in the marketplace. Those were the results of years of research and development. These developments may be used by the innovative companies as well as the generic companies to try and differentiate their products back in this highly competitive market. Of course, there are always other ways to distinguish your product. We feel we have driven real change in the nasal innovation market by formulating for MDIs and indeed developing our own nasal MDI device. There are many ways for competitors to mimic the most attractive parts of your product. And of course, this isn't unique to the pharma industry. The trick is to keep moving ahead and innovating. It's one of the costs of doing business today. Thank you, Richard, for giving us this overview of a very dynamic industry and its unique challenges. Can you give us some final thoughts around what actions someone in this industry could take to help ensure future success? It would be my pleasure. For starters, I have to say that it's very important not to stand still. Keep moving like a shark. For a find a partner that can move with you and support you every step of the way, look for someone who's committed to your mutual success, since it's very difficult indeed to survive in the industry alone. Also, find someone with a proven track record of delivering and adapting swiftly to new challenges. Their knowledge of you and your business and their ability to adapt quickly could be the edge that sustains your success. If not, you may find it difficult to survive. That may sound harsh, but it's been proven true time and time again. You've been listening to Pharmaceutical Technologies podcast on how to master change through life and inhalation drug delivery. Brought to you by 3M Drug Delivery Systems. 3M provides proven and innovative inhalation solutions to help their partners succeed. To learn more, please visit them on the web at 3M.com/dds.